So we're continuing on in, uh, in our second unit in this class by looking at some ethical issues. That is, we're engaged in applied ethics. So we're going to try to apply those different frameworks that we learned in the first unit to some issues that face us today. Today I asked you to look at a piece that tries to provide a defense of free speech. In this piece, the writer, Jonathan Rausch, argues that while there are some moral concerns having to do with speech, we have some political goals, some political out uh, duties, some scientific duties that perhaps outweigh uh, our duty to censor speech. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. This was not listed in the article, um, but I thought it would be a good idea to first go over what are some of the arguments that people give, the moral arguments for censoring speech. What arguments have you all heard? Why should we censor speech, if at all? To keep the peace? To keep the peace? Okay. What well, society will like devolve into chaos if we let everybody say whatever the hell they want all the time? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. What else? Uh, kind of the same thing, but like so people won't get offended. So people won't get offended? Okay. So the idea is something like speech can hurt, and we want to be like loving people. We don't want to be assholes, right? Anything else? Any other arguments that you can think of? Maybe think politics. Yes? I think depending on the country, it could be the quash any, quash any dissent. Yeah, yeah, maybe it might be a good idea to censor speech because allowing it can destabilize our society, right? Maybe you're worried about coups or revolutions or something like that. Sure. Yeah, what y'all have expressed here is basically what I've heard as well. Some of the arguments that came up for me when I was thinking about this issue. First, speech can generally harm people, right? It can hurt people's feelings. It can lower their self-esteem. Threats can cause people to be very anxiety ridden and live in fear, right? These are all less than ideal moral situations. Generally, we don't want people to live in fear. We don't want people to have low self-esteem, to think badly of themselves. We don't want people's feelings to be hurt. We want, want to try to be nice and loving. Speech can generally harm people. So maybe that's a good reason to censor it. Another reason that you might hear, especially if you're involved in political discussions nowadays, is that speech upholds and perpetuates oppression in society. The contemporary progressive line of thought today is our society is built on these categories and words and structures that systemically disadvantage some social groups. Speech also plays that role. Like some of the social structures we have, the progressive is going to argue that, look, speech can function to hold down certain social groups in society. An example of this would be hate speech, right? Perpetuating, perpetuating racist views or sustaining or producing more inequity in society. That is, lack of equal distribution of wealth, capital, health, etc. Finally, speech, just in general, and this is kind of a utilitarian argument, may lead to bad social consequences. Think about all the things that people can do with speech. People can use speech and media to misinform others. Right? Misinformation is a big thing that people are worried about today, especially on the internet. People can abuse their speech to mislead people, to cause people to have false beliefs, to act under false pretenses. Right? This isn't good. Speech can 
further hasten the degradation of society. If you let people say whatever the hell they want, well, maybe you're worried about the moral state of society kind of devolving a little bit. Maybe you're worried about people becoming meaner. Maybe you're worried about people becoming softer. I don't know. Speech can produce also chaotic situations. Uh, the famous example of this is yelling fire in a crowded theater, right? You're in a crowded space, you whip up a crowd into a, a frenzy, and that can have bad effects on people, right? People can get hurt, uh, trampled, whatever it may be. So, speech can have bad consequences. It can hurt people, it can perpetuate oppression, and it can produce bad social outcomes. These are generally the arguments that are given in favor of censoring speech. The piece that I asked you to read for today is going to be trying to provide a defense of free speech. As we'll see, our thinker Jonathan Rausch is going to argue that while these reasons might be good, we might have obligations to protect individual liberty, to protect the pursuit of science that outweigh these ethical concerns. So that's what we're going to be investigating today. To do that, we're looking at an article written by this guy. Jonathan Rausch is an American thinker, writer, activist, uh, gay journalist. He's somebody who has been very critic in the last few decades of US government public policy. He's focused in his writings on same-sex marriage and other topics related to LGBT activism. So this isn't your typical like white religious conservative, okay, that is defending free speech. This is a guy who has experienced discrimination in his life due to his sexuality. And yet he still thinks that free speech is important and that perhaps the ethical concerns that we just laid out shouldn't be weighed as heavily as some of the other obligations that we have to the health of our society, to scientific progress. So I'd like you to just keep that in mind as we go through the discussion today. I'm going to start by giving you just a few general notes on this piece, and then we'll look more specifically at the reasons that Rausch gives for defending free speech and why he thinks it's important. Generally, this article is concerned with the place of speech in our society. Rausch is also going to provide an analysis of our society in general, and US society in particular, and basically what he's going to be saying is within the last few decades, our society has become saturated with this desire to become pure. That is, eliminate all discrimination and prejudice. And in other words, he's going to be saying that our society has become a little bit obsessed with political correctness. That's kind of the angle that he's taking in this piece. This is what he calls purism. His goal here is to defend people's right to incendiary speech. So he's going to say that, look, even though speech can have these bad ethical consequences, people should still have the right to engage in speech that harms, that wounds, that speaks truth to power, because this fundamental liberty is worth protecting over and above just trying to protect somebody's feelings, for example. So he's going to defend people's right to incendiary speech, and he's going to try to provide arguments in favor of this view. He's going to provide a bunch of reasons why he thinks censoring speech might be bad. And we're going to see if you agree with him today and what you think about those reasons. 
Any questions so far? Okay, well let's get into it then. Let's see what Rausch has to say. He starts off this short article by noting that both the right and the left sides of the political aisle have argued that there is no room for any prejudicial or hate speech in society. The right generally argues, for example, that Christians are victims of prejudice and discrimination. There's a lot of Christian bashing going on. And the left generally argues that there's a lot of race, gender, sex bashing that's going on. And that people are being discriminated against based, based on their race, their gender, their sex, etc. We find people on both sides of the political aisle arguing that this is bad, that we should try to eliminate this kind of speech. But Rausch does not agree with this. Okay? He sees these attitudes and prescriptions falling out of this obsession with political correctness that he calls purism in this article. He thinks that this purism has saturated American society and that this purism argues that society cannot be just until the last traces of invidious prejudice have been scrubbed away. The general idea being, look, again, speech harms. It produces bad consequences. We should not rest until we can completely eliminate prejudice and discrimination from our society. Rausch is going to interrogate whether or not this is a good goal, whether or not it is possible to achieve, and whether or not we might actually have some concerns that outweigh trying to eliminate discrimination and prejudice. I'll give you a few moments to finish typing or writing. If you're like me, you type much faster than you write. He says that proponents of political correctness, or what he calls purism, argue that our primary goal right now should be to eliminate racism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of prejudice from society. That we should all work together to completely eliminate this stuff. That this is possible and that this should be our primary goal when it comes to speech, when it comes to conversation. But Rausch does not agree with that. He does not think that eliminating prejudicial speech, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia should be our primary goal in society. And he lists a bunch of different reasons for this. He thinks that there are other goals that we should be prioritizing more. And as we'll see, he actually doesn't think this is an achievable goal. So let's see if you agree with his reasons. We'll go through them one by one with a few different quotes interspersed to help give you a better sense of what Rausch is trying to get at here. The first reason that he gives is that it is not always easy to distinguish between what is prejudicial, what is discriminatory, and what is not. He utilizes an example in this piece that we'll get to in a little bit to try to make this idea a little bit more well-supported. That is, he argues it's not obvious whether there's prejudice in a situation or not. Sometimes it is, but a lot of the times it's actually very tricky to determine if somebody is speaking or acting in a discriminatory way. So there's already a little murkiness or a little fuzziness that we have to contend with. As such, we should be cautious about censoring speech. Second, he argues that eliminating prejudice involves in eliminating dissent and pluralism. That is, it somehow involves homogenizing people's worldviews, beliefs, homogenizing people's speech, and that this is not good. 
he notes that we shouldn't try to force people to get on the same terms linguistically speaking or necessarily belief-wise because diversity of belief and opinion is necessary to the health of society. And being allowed to say what you need to say is a necessary political tool for minority groups to help achieve their social and economic goals. Think about the civil rights movement. Rausch would say, if those proponents of the civil rights movement had their speech censored, minority groups wouldn't have the same rights that they do today. They wouldn't have the same place that they do in society today. So we need to allow for people to dissent, to speak their mind. We need to allow people to speak truth to power. Censoring speech would be taking away one of the political tools that minority groups have to further their causes, and that this is not good. Here's what he has to say about these two reasons. Firstly, at the University of Michigan, a student said in a classroom discussion that he considered homosexuality a disease treatable with therapy. He was summoned to a formal disciplinary hearing for violating the school's policy against speech that victimizes people based on sexual orientation. Now, the evidence is abundant that this particular hypothesis is wrong, and any American homosexual can attest to the harm that this student's hypothesis has inflicted on many real people. But was it a statement of prejudice or misguided belief? Hate speech or hypothesis? Many Americans who do not regard themselves as bigots or haters believe that homosexuality is a treatable disease. They may be wrong, indeed Rausch would say they are wrong, he's gay himself, but are they all bigots? I am unwilling to say so. And if you are willing, beware. The line between a prejudiced belief and a merely controversial one is elusive. And the harder you look, the more elusive it becomes. God hates homosexuals is a statement of fact, not of bias to those who believe it. American criminals are disproportionately black is a statement of bias, not of fact to those who disbelieve it. The sweeping implications of this challenge to pluralism are not, I think, well enough understood by the public at large. Indeed, the br new brand of totalism has yet to be properly named. Multiculturalism, for instance, is much too broad. Political correctness comes closer, but it is too trendy and snide. For lack of anything else, I will call the new anti-pluralism purism, since its major tenet is that society cannot be just until the last traces of invidious prejudice have been scrubbed away. Whatever you call it, the purest way of seeing things has spread through American intellectual life with remarkable speed, so much so that many people will blink at you uncomprehendingly or even call you a racist or sexist or homophobe, etc., if you suggest that expressions of racism should be tolerated or that prejudice has its part to play. What is especially dismaying is that the purists pursue prejudice in the name of protecting minorities. In order to protect people like me, a homosexual, they must pursue people like me, dissident. In order to bolster minority self-esteem, they suppress minority opinion. There are, of course, all kinds of practical and legal problems with the purist campaign, the incursions against the First Amendment, the inevitable abuses by prosecutors and activists who define as hateful or violent whatever speech they dislike or can score points off of, the lack of any evidence that repressing prejudice eliminates rather than inflames it, but minorities of all people ought to remember that by definition we cannot prevail by numbers and we generally cannot prevail by force. Against the power of ignorant mass opinion and group prejudice and superstition, we have only our voices. If you doubt that minorities' voices are powerful weapons, think of the lengths to which Southern officials went to silence the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. 
Think of how much gay people have improved their lot over 25 years simply by refusing to remain silent. Recall the Michigan student who was prosecuted for saying that homosexuality is a treatable disease. And notice that he was black. Under that Michigan speech code, more than 20 blacks were charged with racist speech, while no instance of racist speech by whites was punished. In Florida, the hate speech law was invoked against a black man who called a policeman a white cracker. Not so, surprisingly. In the first hate crimes case to reach the Supreme Court, the victim was white and the defendant black. In the escalating war against prejudice, the right is already learning to play by the rules that were pioneered by the purest activists of the left. Thus, last year, leading Democrats, including the president, criticized the Republican Party for being increasingly in the thrall of the Christian right. Some of the rhetoric was harsh, fire-breathing Christian radical right, but it wasn't vicious or even clearly wrong. Never mind. When Democratic Representative Vic Fazio said Republicans were, quote, being forced to the fringes by the aggressive political tactics of the religious right, the chairman of the Republican National Committee, Haley Barber, said Christian bashing was the left's preferred form of religious bigotry. Bigotry, prejudice. Quote, Christians active in politics now are on the receiving end of an extraordinary campaign of bias and prejudice said the conservative leader, William J. Bennett. One discerns here where the new purism leads. Eventually, any criticism of any group will be prejudice. So you can see his thoughts here, right? He's bringing up a, 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 many different points as to why he thinks censoring speech is bad. Let's kind of get more specific and lay those out in a more explicit way. He questions whether or not censoring speech is actually going to achieve the goals that the censors want to achieve. He actually thinks it's counterproductive, first of all. What does censoring speech do? It doesn't eliminate racism, transphobia, sexism. What it seems to do, he's arguing, is it pushes it underground into dark places where it can fester. Instead, what we should be doing is let people say what they want to say, let people's prejudiced beliefs enter the court of public opinion, and then by letting people comment on it, it can be shown how stupid or wrong that it is, and it will die away. So he's saying censorship is actually counterproductive. It's not going to eliminate racism, sexism, etc. It's actually just going to make it hidden, a little bit more hidden, where it can continue to grow and be sustained. Subjecting these views to public criticism is the winning strategy. Another point that he ends up making later in the piece is that he disagrees with this fundamental idea that words are violence. He thinks that the purists are wrong to claim this. And He's going to argue that time spent punishing people for their speech is time ill spent. Because that time could actually be used to affect change in the real world, to help out communities, to improve their lot, to give them access to opportunities, etc. So time that we spend punishing people for their speech is time and resources that we could be spending on actually improving the real world. Not just trying to correct people's beliefs, but actually improving things physically, socially, economically. He says, the fear engendered by these words is real. But the remedy is as clear and as imperfect as ever to protect citizens against violence. This, I grant, is something that American society has never done very well and now does quite poorly. It is no solution to define words as violence or prejudice as oppression. And then by cracking down on words or thoughts, pretend that we are doing something about violence and oppression. No doubt it is easier to pass a speech code or hate crimes law 
and proclaim the streets safer than actually to make the streets safer. But the one must never be confused with the other. Every cop or prosecutor chasing words is one fewer chasing criminals. In a world rife with real violence and oppression, full of Rwandas and Bosnias, and 11-year-olds spraying bullets at children in Chicago, and in turn being executed by gang lords, it is odious of Toni Morrison to say that words are violence. Equating verbal violence with physical violence is a treacherous, mischievous business. Not long ago, a writer was charged with viciously and gratuitously wounding the feelings and dignities of millions of people. He was charged, in effect, with exhibiting flagrant prejudice against Muslims and outrageously slandering their beliefs. What is freedom of expression, mused Salman Rushdie, a year after the Ayatollah sentenced him to death and put a price on his head? Without the freedom to offend, it ceases to exist, he said. I can think of nothing sadder than that minority activists, in their haste to make the world better, should be the ones to forget the lesson of Rushdie's plight. For minorities, pluralism, not purism, is the answer. The campaigns to eradicate prejudice, all of them, the speech codes and workplace restrictions and mandatory therapy for accused bigots and all the rest, should stop now. The whole objective of eradicating prejudice as opposed to correcting and criticizing it, should be repudiated as a fool's errand. Salman Rushdie is right, Toni Morrison wrong, and minorities belong at his side, not hers. So you can see what he's getting at here generally, right? He thinks that censoring speech is counterproductive. He thinks that it's easy for us to mistake ourselves into thinking that we're making the world a better place by just cracking down on speech and actually not doing anything about the social structures in our society. And he warns us about what censoring speech might do. What it would necessarily involve is creating a political tools that can then be abused by your opponents once they come into power. Think about it. Let's say President Joe Biden and the Democrats pass a bunch of uh, laws that censor speech. What do you think is going to happen when a Republican becomes president or there's a Republican majority in the Senate? They're going to use those same political tools right, to censor people. Is that a road that we want to go down, Rausch asks? We need to be careful not to create laws and political tools that can be abused by the other side. And I think he just has a general concern with protecting people's individual liberties. Finally, he doesn't actually think that this goal that the purists have is actually achievable. He doesn't believe that we're ever actually going to be able to eliminate completely racism, prejudice, homophobia, transphobia from society. He doesn't think it's an achievable goal. It's a fool's errand. And so instead of chasing after that, what we should be chasing after is doing those things that are actually going to improve minority social groups' lives not just trying to censor people's speech. The last argument that he gives in favor of, or in his defense of free speech, of incendiary speech, is that he thinks it's necessary for scientific advancement. He asks us to consider what would have happened if Einstein had not been allowed to express whatever he wanted to express in his scientific writings, in his research. He thinks that censoring speech can have the unattended consequence of preventing scientific and technological advancement. Because if you censor speech, you end up in some way censoring thought. By censoring speech and thought, 
You prevent people from coming up with new ideas and expressing them, allowing us to progress our society along epistemic lines. So that basically covers all of the reasons that Rausch gives in defense of speech in this short article. What do you all think of his view? Do you agree with him? Do you disagree with him? I'd love to hear from you all. What do you think? Yes? Okay. But I definitely agree, like, uh, hate speech is like, like, that needs to be stopped, but it is actually kind of needed in some way. Okay. So you're saying, look, hate speech is bad and it's immoral, but we shouldn't, I don't know, make it illegal? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think we can all recognize how speech harms people, right? What Rausch is arguing is that we have some sort of political and scientific duty to protect this right. So we should allow unethical speech to exist for the sake of the health of our society. What were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say I kind of agree that um, like obviously sometimes hate speech is like bad, but I think that it's, um, like it's kind of inevitable and that there shouldn't be laws against it. Like it always happens. I think like no matter if there's laws against it or not. So you, it sounds like you're agreeing with him that um, eliminating prejudice and discrimination is not achievable. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And then... What was the other point you were making? Or were you agreeing kind of generally with his idea that protecting this right is more important yeah. than outlawing harmful speech? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes? I agree with him with the fact that like there is like pushback and different thoughts that need to be expressed to actually progress. But how much, you know, how much uh, conversation is being started from someone just yelling around slurs, you know? Like, there's. Right. No, I don't see a world in where that being legal has any positive effect to how, you know, we communicate and how we, you know, evolve our ideas over time. But I think certain things, like, yeah, you gotta have some controversial things being said, but not like slurs. Like, that make any sense. Right, right. We could say, like, no real good comes from using slurs, right? And we could say, like, that doesn't really push the conversation forward at all, right? Like, it doesn't seem to help anybody. I suppose the question that he's trying to get us to consider is, if there is a line to censoring speech at all, we should be cautious about drawing it. And we should be very cautious about where we try. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say I agree with him. I think that speech is like kind of self-governing. Like if somebody. It's what? It's like self-governing. Self-governing. Okay. If somebody's going to be an asshole, go out and just like, you know, cuss people out all the time or use hate speech against others, I feel like they're going to get outcasted by like most of society. Okay. 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 Yeah. I would also say that with having laws like this, it builds a culture, you know, around not spreading hate speech, right? And not, you know, speaking like that. It builds a culture with that when you know it's not a thing you should be doing. And, you know, allowing that to be legal and building a culture where it's like, hey, just push that guy to the side, I think that opens up to very hateful, like, ideas coming out of it. Like, say, like, Nazism, you know? 
Like, if there's no track record of going against hate speech, say there's a weird time in the world, someone could very easily do what we saw before by using hate speech. So, yeah, that, that would be a reason in favor of censoring it, right? Like, the law does serve as a guidepost for people, right? And it kind of serves as a, a guide to how our culture develops. Yeah? Yes? I would say that he used censoring speech so he wouldn't have any political opponents, so no one could speak out against him. That's how all dictators are. So free speech is a method to keep people safe from dictators. The good that comes from free speech outweighs the harm. Okay, so you think on a utilitarian analysis it's defensible. And it sounded like you were also saying um, it's necessary to protect free speech because censoring speech could potentially lead to some really bad outcomes, like politically speaking. Yeah. I mean, it seems a good idea to say, oh, well, we shouldn't, you know, hate each other, so let's kind of do something about this. But you give someone an inch, they'll take a mile. So, okay. Like you said about being careful where we draw that line. Once we draw a line, the line can be moved. And I don't know if we want a line to begin with. Okay, so again, kind of invoking this idea that, look, setting up laws like this runs the risk of it being abused by somebody. And you may be worried about being abused by your political opponents, right? Yeah, okay. What do the rest of you all think? Do you think that we have some sort of political obligation that outweighs our ethical obligations here to protect people's feelings or however you want to characterize it. It's more than just protecting people's feelings, right? Maybe that is making light of it because words do really hurt people, right? Words, literally if they're said too much when you're a child, right, can generate some sort of complex within you. Trauma, whatever you want to call it. So words are very powerful. It's obvious that they can harm. Do our political obligations outweigh those ethical concerns? I don't think it's political. You don't think it's political? No. Maybe you think it's more basic, like what he was getting at with the Einstein thing? What were you going to say? I'd say, even in a political situation, it would be more ethical to allow free speech. Okay. We all, I'm sure everyone's taken basic history of class. Hitler's bad. Stalin's bad. Sure. Mussolini's bad. They've all used censoring speech to quell any rebellion <coughs> that would make life better for their people. So... It's not necessarily political. It's a political setting, but it's an ethical value. Okay. So you're kind of invoking this idea that he brought up that the use of speech is a necessary political tool. Like, and in the sense that it's used to better people's lives, that it's used to advocate for communities, that it's ethical to use it that way, and it should be used that way. And that establishing that outweighs any harms that come from people abusing it by calling people slurs or bad names. Maybe. I also don't think it's good to censor free speech just because like I think that kind of preserves or like encourages people to become like this people pleaser type of person and okay. Thing, really 
So you're, it seems like you're kind of invoking Aristotle's ideas insofar as censoring speech is not going to allow you to build the character necessary to have a flourishing life. Correct. Do you all agree with that? Yeah? I'd say that even goes further to the societal level. If I can't criticize something that might not be the greatest situation, but I'm not allowed to criticize it at all, then there's no way we can improve. Okay. So it's necessary to protect speech because speech is what allows us to express what's going on. Mm -hmm. It allows us to dissent to power. It allows us to make plans amongst ourselves for how we can improve things. OK. Yes? I was going to make a point here about some of the totalitarian nations that have existed throughout history and now. Because uh, there are people that, the people who leave the regime, right, they ensure that uh, those who live within the country have a very censored education. You know, censorship has pretty much existed in all aspects of their life, right? And due to that censorship, they're not really going to have access to what's good, true, beautiful. They're not going to be able to build up the virtues necessary in order to, you know, criticize something they find to be wrong. Okay. Or something that's good. Okay, so yeah, you're you're kind of taking the Aristotle point and you're you're expanding it. You're saying mass censorship in society prevents people in that society from learning and growing and becoming the best versions of themselves. Now, now is it true that the, the virtue theory is uh, the theory that's most widely held by the Catholic Church? Uh, it it strongly influences Thomas Aquinas's philosophy. Yeah, which is like a cornerstone of Catholic theology. So he kind of, this is a tangent, he kind of takes Christian theology and Aristotle's virtue theory and kind of tries to combine them. So in a way, yeah. Is there anybody here that thinks no, like Rausch is wrong? Obviously we should censor some forms of speech. Why not hate speech? Do we want people running around shouting slurs at each other? Does that help anybody? Does that improve things? No? Nobody wants to defend censorship? Yeah? Or to take a stab at it, well, play devil's advocate? Well, I was just going to say, like, censoring and all that kind of stuff, too, also just like, like imagine um, you're a minority and there's a group of people that like attack you with hate speech like regularly. Um, censoring that. So why, why would you want that speech to be out in the open? What would that allow you to do? Well, I think it would allow me to be like, yeah, there's a problem with this. Like, you know, have my own okay. group of people. Like, I think people just naturally have different beliefs. And, like, through speech they can find people that they relate to. Kind of build a community within that. And I think, um, like, everybody just has their own sort of lifestyle that they need to find their own community or people they agree with instead of just trying to get everybody to agree with the same principles and causes on a mass scale. Okay. What I was thinking was something like this. The good thing about allowing all kinds of forms of speech is that even though hate speech will come out of that, now you know who the hateful bigots are, right? And you can avoid them. The bad thing about allowing hate speech is that you may be subjected to those words. And it will be hurt. It will harm you, right? It will hurt you. So I guess it depends on what you value more. Would you rather have the knowledge of who you think the bigots are 
so you can try to change their minds or avoid them? Or would you rather insulate yourself from those words? Um, one thing, one thought I have is uh, if you're against restricting any speech, I think you would have to be also against uh, what is it? What's the technical term for inciting a riot? Because you you could say those are two different things, but I could very well incite a riot through just using slurs or just using harmful sure. sentences or harmful things to talk about. I could very well, you know, get people going. Yeah. And how do you, if you get rid of one, get rid of the other, how do you tell the two? You're leaving such a subjective thing up to a judge. Right. I had one other thing too. Uh, wait. You know, oh, what he was saying is uh, how people with similar ideas have to get together and just form their own groups through that. What happens when you have a, a group of people that was able to talk freely about hateful ideas and they form hateful groups from that? And then you have parts of the country that it just opens the way for racism and other forms of intolerance to grow. Right. So, so the worry is not censoring hate speech might allow for the proliferation of these ideas and these groups, right, which might harm society. Yeah, that's indeed a worry. And, and another worry that you bring up is, look, if you're going to be a free speech absolutist, it sounds like you have to allow all these other kinds of things that we want to, you know, uh, clamp down on, that we currently clamp down on, like threats or slander or inciting a riot, right? Yeah, how do you be consistent there? Is there a firm distinction, you know, between, I don't know, uh, a threat and calling somebody a slur? Like, should we regard those as the same thing legally, morally? Maybe when it comes down to like the legality of things, and like obviously inciting a riot is a little bit different than making like a bigoted remark against a certain group of people. Um, but I think if you look at like maybe the objective outcome of this, of like this, of some of these words, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we can. Maybe one way we can sidestep this problem is by yeah, looking at the actual consequences of our words. Did it ha actually have a negative effect on society? Did it actually like cause murder to happen or theft or something like that? <coughs> of course, there's a problem with analyzing things that way though too. Imagine I said something as a joke, and you believed it. And like I was being literal, and then you went out and murdered someone. Like, should I be on the hook for that? You know, am I responsible for that? Here now we're getting into, well, should we follow a more deontological view, the intentions matter, or the utilitarian view, do the consequences matter? And that's a hard, it's a hard thing to determine, right? Yeah, this is a really tricky issue. Right? Because obviously we don't want people running around using slurs. We don't want people to abuse others with their words. But there are dangers that would come with censoring speech, I think. So the question we need to ask ourselves 
is what do we value more? What kind of society do we want? You know, do you personally want a society that censors some kinds of speech or not? And what do you think will happen as a result of that? I think this debate sometimes centers around whether or not we consider words to be violence. This is another issue that he considered in this piece. This is a phrase that you will hear today, right? Words are violence. And you may hear that silence is violence. Do you all believe that? Do you think words are violence? And is there a difference between something being violence and violent? This is another important idea, right? If you think words are violence, then you should treat them the same way, perhaps legally, that you would treat physical actions, right? But if you don't, then, yeah, why would you treat somebody's words the same as you would, you know, somebody <coughs> smacking another person? I think there has to be a distinction between real threats and something that isn't a real threat. I've had you know, patients come up to me and say, like, mental patients, that aren't right, there's something wrong, and they say crazy things, like they're going to strangle me, they're going to, you know, electrocute me, blah, 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 blah. There's no threat there because, you know, there's nothing in their right mind. But if I go up to you after class and say, hey, you better change my grade or I'm going to fucking stab you, there might be a problem. Yeah. So, like, that's... <laughs> That's an example where it could be violence, but if something else is saying that, you know, that's... Yeah. If you hear that from, like, a toddler and they watch their movie... Right. Is that truly violence? Right, yeah. We, we can distinguish between threats that are real and threats that are not real, right? But, but what do you all think? Like, do you think, do you think words are akin to, like, physical acts of violence? It's your choice on how you want to react to them. Whereas if somebody like strikes you, yes. like that's different. Yes, it's still bad. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that. That, yeah. It's, I think it can be a helpful attitude to have in some circumstances. But I think the worry is that people feel like something unjust is being done to them when somebody uses words like that, you know? I think that's... And, and they're trying to seek justice by punishing the person. It, it, go spend time with people. Yeah. Go spend time with people that aren't going to call you slurs, or go be around people that are going to like actually be comforting and welcome you. Like, yeah. I think it's yeah. Better to spend our time um, doing things that are going to like help us be more positive and just have a more positive perspective, rather than oh, there's these bad people out to get me. Um, I need to do something. Okay. Well, what would you say to someone who came back with, well, look, I'm protecting other people too by, get, by getting this person locked up, let's say. They're not going to be able to hurt others. And that's a good thing. Right. Yeah, that does make sense. I didn't really think about that. Um, 
it's tricky, right? Like, in general, we want people to be independent, you know, strong, uh, courageous in their beliefs and their expressions, open-minded, right? How do we balance helping people cultivate those kinds of characters with social justice in society? It's hard, right? This is something that people are, everybody's having debates about nowadays, right? Can we establish social justice without violating people's rights, without redistributing wealth? Are those things even bad? Like maybe rights aren't all that important. I don't know. We'll have to think about that. But I think with this topic, we all kind of speak like our age group, not really you, uh, in a place of coming from like ignorance and how like we grew up with this view, like the stereotypical view of like the racist, uh, hillbilly Republican, and uh, multi-gender like liberal, right? Like that stereotypical view. And like we hear like, oh, you misgendered me, blah, blah, blah. I think a lot of us aren't thinking of the fact, like look back to 2001. Would you consider, like after the terrorist attacks, like Islamic people in this country were treated horribly. I would consider those acts of violence. If you go back 60 years and you look at, you know, Jim Crow laws, like the way people were heckled for all that stuff, like I'd consider that violence. That okay. Was, that was every day something they had to survive through. And I think we forget about that and we're coming from a place where you can speak about it. Okay, so would you say, like, in those instances, there was violent stuff happening? There was yeah, violence? But it's not the same today? It, I mean, it's, the thing is, though, if you open the doors to hate speech, it can. That can open the doors to subjugation of an ethnic group or yeah. religion of anything. Like, if you live, if you were a Jew living in 1940s Germany, are you telling me when you're walking down the street, you might have not got hit all the time, but you were facing everything from everywhere, no matter what. I would consider that violence. Okay. So maybe maybe our thoughts on this discussion should be more historically informed. Or maybe we should reflect on, yeah, what has happened in the past, how badly some groups have had it in the past, how things have changed, all that taken into account. So much context goes into this, you can't just say one ultimatum. There's a right or wrong. There's so much context that has to be deciphered. Okay. So yeah, it's not such a cut and dry issue, no. is what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, finally, again, this is the, the discussion we've been having the entire time. You should consider, you should reflect on whether or not protecting freedom of speech is more important than outlawing hate speech, for example. Try to look at it through the different ethical theories that we've investigated in the first unit. I think a utilitarian can be made, a utilitarian case can be made for both sides. One being that more good is going to come out if we let people have freedom of speech. Another being, no, the opposite is actually true. The ethics of care, right, might... Well, I think you could, you could devise a, an argument on either side of that, too. Because sometimes caring for someone involves telling them things that they don't want to hear. Now, does that ever include hate speech? Probably not, but... You see what I mean. Although, words do harm people. So, it's true that our words do not constitute care. Many times. Think about the kind of society that you want to live in. Think about what may happen, positively or negatively, as a result of censoring speech. Does anybody have any final questions? Concerns, otherwise, I'll let you all go a little early today. Okay, well, talk about this with your friends and family members. See what they think. Really think about this. This is a hot button issue nowadays. It's worth discussing, it's worth thinking about. Okay, I will see you all on uh, Thursday. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>